Okay, out of the way, Newton. We're going to study electricity, and you weren't able to do any of that, so we don't need you now. Today, we discuss inductance, and you'll be a little bit annoyed with me because, uh, well, inductance starts with I, and we've already got current that is I in our circuits. So we're going to have to use a different letter for inductance. And let, maybe I should just say what an inductor is. An inductor, I mean, maybe the classic example of an inductor is simply a solenoid. And, uh, well, you know, if you make current go through the solenoid, it will make a magnetic field. I guess if current is coming in this way, then uh, you see the top of the solenoid is first, and so the current will be going this way around the solenoid, which says the magnetic field in the solenoid will be pointing to the right. Um, okay, so that's the principle of a solenoid, but I'm going to have to try to draw this sucker really carefully, and this will be my inductor. I'm going to come around here like this, and then go back behind, and come around go back behind. And you should probably try to do this in your notes too because this is important to see which way stuff is going. And as it leaves, it's going to come out here like this and then come over and join our circuit. Sorry, should have spaced that a little bit better. But there we are. This sucker right here is called an inductor and I'm going to use a script L to represent inductance. And this is a switch here, ain't no thing, and this is a resistor with some resistance, and this is the voltage of my battery. <clears throat> so, you see, what's going to happen is I will close this switch so that we can learn about inductance. That's right, I'm prepared to close the switch so that you can learn. When I close the switch, current will begin to flow which direction? Of course. Current will flow this direction, which means that current in the solenoid will be coming around this direction, going out in front. And question for you, if current goes through a solenoid, what happens inside the solenoid? Answer to that question, a magnetic field. Let's go green for the magnetic field. We've been doing that a lot. And the magnetic field in this case would be this direction in the middle of the solenoid and as the current gets bigger and bigger, the field will be getting bigger and bigger. Do you think that this loop appreciates the fact that the field through it is getting bigger and bigger? Now, this is a little bit subtle because the loop itself is creating the field. So the loop is changing the field, but at the same time, the loop doesn't want to change the field. So this is a rather complicated arguing with itself, and I'll define it to be self-inductance. Self-inductance. And the point is that this inductor doesn't ever want to have current going through it unless the current has already been going through it. This is like, look at how fickle nature, isn't this insane? It doesn't want to have anything change. It doesn't want to have the current go through it at all. And so as a response, the inductor will develop an induced voltage. And you know that that induced voltage, well, shoot, you know what that induced voltage is going to be, but we don't need to go concrete on it yet. I guess my point is, as the current gets bigger and bigger, the field gets bigger and bigger, and the inductor gets pissed about that. The inductor will try not to allow current to flow. And what's the way not to allow current to flow? Well, I'm going to draw this circuit again. You've got, your, um, you've got your battery and your resistor, and now the switch is closed. Sorry, we'll draw it like that. We'll say that the switch closed, and then you've got, well, Instead of an inductor, we've kind of got, well, it's going to act like it doesn't want current to flow. And the way to make current not flow would be to put a battery right here. That's what the inductor looks like. It's a battery facing the other direction. And I like to call this, well, this is V bat here. And this battery is going to be doing its darndest. And if it's a perfect inductor, it's going to be absolutely preventing any current from ever going through it if there was no current going through it beforehand. So this guy right here, I like to call a bad battery. It is opposing everything you're trying to do. The inductor appears in the circuit as if it's a bad battery, but you see, eventually current will begin to flow because no inductors are perfect and the bad battery slowly dies. 
we have a slowly dying bad battery. Eventually, the circuit becomes this. As more and more current begins to flow, eventually the circuit becomes good battery, resistor, switch that's closed, and nothing. Uh-huh, that says time goes on, and that says time goes on. So you've got initially a very, very pissed bad battery, but eventually the bad battery goes away and stops bothering you because nature gets used to the current that's going through there. And then, well, do you think that if we opened the switch, do you think that the inductor would be happy that the current stopped? Oh no! No, inductors don't like current to start, and they also don't like current to stop. So before we go into a little more detail, I'll show you a couple more examples <coughs> of inductors. You can have a classic inductor shaped like a solenoid, and this would be an example of that. It's a, called a gilly coil, used for magnetic experience generally, but uh, here we go. That is a solenoid shaped one. You can have a toroidal inductor. I pulled that out of something, I don't even remember what, but it's wrapped around a torus. <laughs> And so it has a whole bunch of inductance. It's like, oh, it's like a solenoid curled around itself whoop, and joined in. And you could also have an inductor that's really as simple as just a half loop. Even this is sufficient in some sensitive circuits to provide enough inductance to get what you're trying to get done. So let's try to figure out what you could do with an inductor. What is its purpose? The voltage induced Induced, inductor, inductance, yeah, they're all related, you bet your pants. I don't wanna talk about, um, I don't wanna talk about signs, so I'm just gonna say that the induced voltage is N times D phi DT for an inductor. I'm gonna put some absolute values around all this business because I'm not interested in it. And I make the following definition. I define inductance times the change in current as time goes on. So inductance is what prevents current from changing. Inductance multiplied by the slope of the current graph gives you the induced voltage. So we can connect these two suckers right here, but let's first identify the unit for inductance. The unit for inductance is, what are we gonna have here? We're gonna call it a Henry. Henry is the unit of inductance after a student I had a few years ago who was very good at it. Actually, it's not after him, but uh, props out to Henry anyway. And you know that, uh, I mean, I guess we could just solve this. We know that a Henry must be voltage times time divided by current, which is amps. Okay, so it's volt seconds per amp. Very interesting unit. It looks doesn't really look like it has a lot to do with magnet magnetism, but it has a ton to do with magnet magnetism. Speak. All right, <clears throat> inductance. Inductance then is equal to, well, I'm gonna solve it in this equation right here. Look at this, if I, um, well, let's, let's put it here like this. I'm gonna say it's N times D phi DT, absolute value, divided by delta I over delta T. And you know these really ought to both be derivatives, so we can beautifully and wonderfully cancel out the delta T's in the denominator. Look how sloppy I'm being with all this math. And we get it's N times the change in flux divided by the change in current. So it has something to do with how flux changes when current changes. I suppose a really good inductor, something with a huge inductance, first of all, has a lot of turns, right? And secondly, has a really big flux if you put a small current through it. Yeah, so you want a lot of turns and you want them tight next to each other. So let's continue finding out what would make something have a good inductance. I'm planning to just plug in here um, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you consider simply, simply a solenoid like this, right? Let's just consider the case of a solenoid, and I'll have to write that down. For solenoid, for solenoid we find that the change in flux, well, I mean, I'm just gonna go all delta on you. It's gonna be N times magnetic field 
times area, that's flux, right? But then the uh, the change in flux might be going, it might be going from zero to the total flux when the current's going through it. So then I'm going to divide that by the current that we're sending through it, which I guess is initially the current zero, that gave us a flux of zero, and finally the current is I, and that gave us a flux of B times A. All right, so then I'm gonna put all this out, and I actually know the magnetic field inside of a simple solenoid like this. It's something we've derived from a previous video. And I'm gonna plug it in at this time. I get N times, well, there's a mu naught, and then there's a number of turns per unit length, and then there's a current, and then I have to multiply all this stuff by A, because I've got N, and this stuff in the middle is B, and then I need to multiply it by A, and I'm subtracting zero, ain't no thing. I'm supposed to divide this thing by I minus zero, which is simply I, and you see that the currents cancel out. This is refreshing. I had hoped that the currents would cancel out, and we find that the inductance of a solenoid is rather simple. It's actually just the number of turns. Well, let's, let's write it a little bit differently. We got number of turns up there twice. So instead, I'm gonna write mu naught times the number of turns square times the area divided by the length. Mm-hmm. But, wait a second, wait a second, area divided by length, number of turns square, wait a second, what if I define lowercase n to be capital N divided by L. No case N then is the number of turns per unit length. Now, I don't have two L's in the denominator here, so I've in fact got mu naught times the number of turns per unit length square, but then I have to multiply by another L, because somehow that canceled out. The length of the solenoid times the area of the solenoid. That's the length of the solenoid times the area of the solenoid. And I think I know what the length of a solenoid times the area of a solenoid is. It's a cylinder, yo. This is simply mu naught times the number of turns per unit length square times the volume of the solenoid. Wow! Inductance depends on the volume of the solenoid. So a big inductor has a big inductance. That's it for now. We'll get back 